The strangest thing for me is I realized that researching North Korea, there were several defectors or uh, refugees fleeing over the demilitarized zone, not to the south as we always believe. No, they fled to the north. A couple of Americans actually. Why? Because they didn't like the Western narrative and this whole um, lie uh, about the Korean War and so on. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I've got another great first time guest coming on. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot more cool anarchists coming out of the woodwork every day now. A lot of things going on, a lot of people waking up, a lot of consciousness raising. And uh, But uh, not to say that uh, our next guest hasn't been an anarchist for a while. I will ask him how he became an anarchist, but I think he's been an anarchist for quite a while. But I just found out about him about a couple months ago, actually. I, when I went to Somalia with uh, Luke Radowski, of We Are Change. When I got back, Doug Casey sent me an angry email and he said, why didn't you tell me you were going? I, w I would have gone with you, which is kind of funny. A lot of people <laughs> wouldn't say they want to go to Somalia with me, but that's Doug. And uh, and then he introduced me to uh, Coley Asperi uh, from Germany originally. He's currently in Monaco. Uh, he's a world traveler. He's actually an extreme traveler. He calls himself. He's actually the founder of Extreme Traveler International Congress. Uh, he's been to 192 of the 193 uh, One World Government Government, United Nations uh, recognized countries. Uh, the only country he hasn't been to, interestingly enough, is Eritrea, and so that, so he's missing one. Uh, and uh, he's also a diplomat of Liberland, as I as am I. And so we're, we have a lot in common. Although I've only been to about 100 countries, he's, he's basically doubled me. Uh, so incredibly fascinating, and he has so many great stories. And uh, Doug uh, uh, actually uh, introduced me to him and said that they were all going to go to Iraq in November. And I was trying to go, but I had a number of things happen and I had to get a visa of course and all this kind of stuff and I, I just couldn't go at the time and actually Doug ended up not going either so that was uh, kind of serendipitous in a weird way that we all didn't end up going but uh, luckily I got introduced to Kolia who's on now with us from Monaco and uh, the more that I know about him the more I'm like we've got to have you not only on Anarchast we have to have you come to Narcopoco and speak and at the Dollar Vigilante Summit because you are one of the most interesting people I've ever virtually met uh, from what I've heard about you and what I know about you. So, uh, Kolya, it's a pleasure to have you on, and uh, why don't you let us know how you became an anarchist? Yeah, hi Jeff, uh, good to talk to you. It's an honor to be on your show. Uh, I think uh, from my heart I've been an anarchist from very early on, and in the mind uh, I had to become maybe 45 years old, about five years ago, uh, to call myself um, an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, why did I have an early um, feeling to be uh, uh, longing for freedom and uh, having a healthy skepticism about the state. Um, my parents were in the foreign service and we were posted to Istanbul, Turkey in 1981. And um, that was quite hard times, the military regime after a putsch. And uh, I was in the German high school, which was one of the three top elite schools in the country where uh, uh, wealthy Turks would uh, send their children. And every Monday morning and Friday evening, we had to uh, sing the national anthem and the flag was raised and it was all about um, uh, the Turkish state and standing there as a foreigner, as a German, having to go through that procedure in a school uniform, standing still, military drill style. But uh, basically for another state, you start asking yourself the question, uh, what, what's that all about, all that symbolism? And it sort of um, reduced uh, the idea, the value of uh, uh, the state for me. And then um, as I became older, um, I, I, I met my wife, but I've never married her because I don't need approval from the state or from church. So um, I'm, I'm very glad to be uh, uh, in a voluntary uh, arrangement with my wife and uh, many other instances where I live my like, life like a libertarian or anarcho-capitalist. And um, to find out about the background, the academic side of it, it took, uh, it took much longer, but uh, here I am talking to you, Jeff, one of the super gurus of an anarcho capitalism. And uh, so uh, I, I'm glad that I can talk about the subject with you today. 
Yeah, that's great. And I uh, can't wait to hear some of your stories of visiting places like North Korea and all that. And uh, you, you make an important point about uh, having grown up outside of your own tax uh, colony. Um, and uh, as a child, it must seem very strange to be, okay, so um, I'm, I'm pledging allegiance to this new thing and they're giving me all this propaganda about this area. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I've always said, and I think I heard you say this once, is that uh, travel is basically the best education really, if you haven't traveled, you really don't really know anything about this world. And, and most of the information we get is wrong. And as a, a traveler myself to about half as many countries as you, I've been in a uh, Thailand uh, movie cinema where you have to stand for some sort of song to the king before the movie. And that might sound really strange and hilarious to people in places like the U.S., but what do you do every time you go to a, a sports ball game or a bread and circus game, a football game? Uh, you have to stand up and they bring out all the flags and all the symbols and all the jingoism and all the uh, uh, pledging allegiance to the state and thanking the troops for protecting you and all these sort of things, which is all complete BS. But yeah, it's really, it's hard for people to, to see it when they've been born in it and grow up in it. And that's what a propaganda is all about. That's what state indoctrination is all about. And, and we actually know now that the uh, U.S. government actually pays the NFL and, and other sports leagues uh, to do those ceremonies at the beginning. When I was younger, there was nothing like that. Uh, they, they did do the national anthem, which is stupid, the national sing-along, as I call it. Uh, but uh, there was none of this, like, flags. And, and now they've got these big flags. I, I watch hockey, and I can't watch. I, I wait till the game starts. I actually watch it on the Internet so I can fast-forward and that sort of a thing. And, uh, you know, if the game starts at 8 o'clock, I tune in at about 8.12 when the game starts because I can't sit there for all these flags and the, the bring up the, the troops and everyone's all, like, they got their hands over their hearts to the state and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but you can't really see that unless you get outside of it, and that's why travel is so important. So when did you first start really um, becoming an extreme traveler, as you say? Um, I, I have to say I, I, th I thank my parents uh, for um, their three postings abroad, which were Turkey and uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and Madrid, Spain, and then uh, Astana, Kazakhstan. Um, at age 11 uh, in Turkey, we were already traveling to the border of Armenia and Georgia and Syria and uh, Iraq. Uh, we didn't cross it at the time, but I had already sort of a very exotic exposure at such a young age. Um, funnily, another thing I learned in Turkey at the time, uh, or a little later, uh, the existence of a deep state, that uh, term comes actually from Turkey. Uh, so that also helped me later on to understand how the world works. Um, so, yeah, the travel with my parents uh, initially, but at age 17, I moved out of house. I did my first uh, uh, world, uh, around the world tour uh, as a windsurfer. I was a big wave windsurfer, so I went to Hukipa, Maui, and that in itself is already um, uh, addicting you to freedom because if, if you get these emotions in nature, big wave surfing, uh, this is obviously um, a lifelong um, state of mind that I developed uh, with my co-fellow surfers there. And then um, through my first job, I was head of sponsorship for Hugo Boss. I traveled all over the world every weekend to represent the brand at Formula One races, at IndyCar races, at T Davis Cup tennis tournaments, golf tournaments. And uh, so I, I, I was traveling a lot. Um, uh, until my age um, 30 already. I had about 100 countries then. But then on a, I, I was for the America's Cup sailing in Auckland and uh, from there I did some side steps to islands and stuff and I met an English couple, 65 years old, who introduced me to the idea of collecting countries, like counting the countries I've already been to. So that was about 100. And then I realized that there's uh, even more. And since then, I, I'm hooked. So the last 10 years, I've traveled like mad all over the world. Yeah, that's great. Uh, something I kind of had in my head at one point, I wanted to go to every country. I guess I still do. but. It's very tiring to do all that, uh, and and a lot of these places aren't necessarily places you really want to go. Not a lot, actually, but there's definitely some. Like Somalia was not somewhere I really wanted to go, but I did want to see what was going on. And this is a real key thing: is 
Uh, the reason I went is as anarchists, we always hear, oh, if you like anarchy so much, go to Somalia. So I was like, well, what's in Somalia? So I went there and there's like eight governments fighting it out in the streets there. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, probably the most sort of what you could call dangerous places I've ever been. Uh, what are some of your uh, most uh, sort of extreme experiences? I definitely, I would say off the top of my head, Somalia, number one, nothing even close. And it's, it's not anarchy there at all. Although you could say everything in life is anarchy. Uh, but it's not uh, what we think of as anarchy. The people there aren't all believing in self-ownership and, and peacefully coexisting and not wanting to rule each other. It's actually almost quite the opposite. The people on the street, uh, some of them are like that, but there's there's all these governments fighting over the area, which is actually something that statists say. They say if there's ever anarchy, then the states will all fight over it. But my whole view on it is if we can get enough people to understand what true self-ownership is, uh, they won't allow people to take them over uh, and things like that. So my number one is Somalia. Uh, number two was Venezuela uh, last year uh, after they were well into hyperinflation and I wanted to go there. I'd, I've been to Venezuela before. I was actually there about 10 years ago. It was really nice. And of course, you know, beautiful, big nightclubs, at which I was into at the time, and, and beautiful girls and great restaurants and Caracas was great. Uh, but I went back last year and they were well into hyperinflation and it was a totally different story. The hotel was put, <laughs> took most of the furniture from the lobby and piled it up in front of the door. I was at the nicest hotel in Caracas and piled it up in front of the door to keep people out at night and stuff like that and uh, things like that. So those are my two most extreme. Uh, I'd have to say of the other like 90 whatever odd countries, most of them were actually quite a bit nicer than most people would expect. So what are, uh, to start off with some of the most, uh, the worst sort of uh, places you've been, the places that you felt uh, you really don't want to go back. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you that uh, Somalia or Mogadishu, in fact, is, uh, is the worst uh, capital in, in the world. Um, it's um, it, it's really wild, and you see so much violence. I mean, I, I, I had a probably a suicide attacker right next to us. Uh, the presidential convoy just passed us with enormous uh, tanks and security and a uh, big convoy, and we still had to wait uh, at this traffic um, uh, corner. And then suddenly a, a, a jeep uh, right in front of us uh, does kind of a power slide, and I found that weird already. So I'm telling my driver, go, go, go. He was just staring there like a sheep. And um, then this car jumped over two huge um, concrete barriers. Uh, it sort of rock climbs of, over those two barriers. And the second one became a jump right in the back of two women, killed them on the spot. Probably a young woman, totally nice dress. And uh, another one with black dress, right, killed them right in front of us. And that moment my driver uh, realized we were really in danger. I was expecting for the car to blow up. It didn't, but uh, certainly the, the guy was stopped then and um, uh, we went, uh, it was dangerous. Um, and you see so much uh, weapons and uh, different militias and security companies. So yes, my number one danger experience would be uh, uh, Mogadishu. Number two is probably Goma in East Congo, because there's three different kinds of danger. You have a lot of war activities, rebels, uh, for many, many years, uh, a lot of UN troops. Uh, actually, you can recognize um, the danger uh, factor uh, from uh, the color of the UN troops. If they're white people, it's a very safe place. And uh, if it's a, a really tough place, they're from Nigeria. And um, so uh, in Goma, you have this sort of danger, rebel activity. Then there's a volcano that occasionally uh, spews out the lava into the city of Goma. So there is very sharp uh, cold lava everywhere and the cars have to crawl over it. Uh, it's very uh, <laughs> tire uh, consuming. And the third danger is there's gas bubbles from Lake Kivu, a beautiful lake, but there's occasional bubbles that uh, have a, a gas that kills cows or sometimes children that uh, walk around. So that is a, a really dangerous city. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mark that one off as one that I probably won't visit anytime soon. By the sounds of it, <laughs> the advantage of Goma is you can visit it quite easily when you come from Rwanda, which is a place which is actually blossoming. It's great, uh, despite the tough history with this huge geno genocide there. Um, but um, from Rwanda, you just go over the border. You don't need a visa. You can go to the visa um, uh, to, to the to the border guard, he's very uh, well nourished, let's say. You can realize from this fact that he's probably open to a discussion. <laughs> and then um, he actually gave me his own driver in a Land Cruiser uh, and uh, a visa on the spot and a city tour of Goma. 
for I think 150 bucks. So uh, that that was very smooth actually. I like these sort of situations when things are possible despite officially they are not possible. In Africa, you get this occasionally. Uh, South yeah, Sudan Kinsey was tough. And says uh, that uh, if you're going to have government, uh, he prefers corrupt governments, and I do as well. I, I prefer, um, you know, in the U.S., if you get pulled over by a cop, you're going to get extorted or killed. That's basically, or you might get lucky, and, and neither will happen. But that's very rare. Uh, if uh, you get pulled over in Mexico, first of all, if you even stop, I don't even stop. But if you do, you buy the police guy a beer, and everything's kind of fine. <laughs> so, Absolutely, so I, I much prefer I, I, that. That's freedom in a way, and it's common sense among people. And this whole corruption idea is mostly about um, uh, you know compliance and um, uh, looking into accounts of people, the war on cash. So um, freedom is still out there, but not in our Western countries. Yeah, absolutely. So you're about to mention another uh, uh, place, I believe. Yes, South Sudan. Uh, I was there just around the foundation of the new state of South Sudan, which uh, the West created. Uh, to extract the oil, uh, which is all in South Sudan and not in the north. So that's a very wild place with a lot of uh, heavy fighting still, uh, which you can easily get into. Um, well, um, my, my let's say my three favorite dangerous uh, places um, <laughs> were those where I learned something, where I took home that um, our narrative in the West is wrong. And those three countries um, were uh, Libya, uh, Syria and North Korea um, and um, uh, I, why, why did I learn that something is wrong with what I've learned in the media at home? Where is the narrative uh, in the West pure propaganda? Let me start with Libya. I went there at the height of the Arab Spring. I think that was May 2011 if I'm not wrong. I entered without a visa driving more than a thousand kilometers from the east from Cairo and I could enter that border because the rebels were already in control and they didn't care about a visa regime. Uh, previously, I was once denied access to Libya, although I had a proper visa because the border guard looked at me um, and he said, um, you have unusual travel behavior. We can't let you in. <laughs> I found this quite strange, unusual travel behavior. OK, <laughs> never mind. So now in this war time, uh, it was the Battle of Benghazi time. Uh, I drove with my best friend with bulletproof um, vests uh, to Benghazi and the inner city was cleared by the rebels so they were holding that and they were full of joy and everything uh, but the battle was just uh, at the front door and um, so obviously I wanted to learn what's going on and one important thing I realized in Libya is that, uh, what a no-fly zone really means. Uh, let's say in our Western media, we think, oh, a no-fly zone is a good thing because um, then this evil uh, local dictator cannot bomb his people from, uh, from the air. And uh, so, yes, we have to support a no-fly zone. The reality is totally different. Uh, a no-fly zone means that the West gets control over the airspace because they have uh, much uh, more sophisticated equipment. And in the case of Libya, uh, with fighter jets and Apache helicopters, uh, the West will bomb the ground troops of the local uh, president, in that case Gaddafi, and thereby make it easier for the rebels to gain ground, to advance and to kill um, uh, the local um, original uh, uh, president and his troops. Uh, and that is a very, um, let's say, a, a single-sided uh, war because it's very easy to, to shoot with such heavy weaponry on, on ground troops. So I've learned that in Libya. And um, in, in Syria, I learned another thing uh, similarly. Uh, you all remember the Battle of Kobane. And um, I, I went to see Kobane on a trip, actually coming from Chechnya by car through um, Georgia, Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Iran, northern Iraq, Kurdistan. Uh, and you can do all that, by the way. People might say, oh my God, what a trip. But this is doable, even if you're a normal person. Yeah. And um, then I, I followed the whole uh, borderline uh, between Turkey and Syria. Uh, this is a so-called Sykes-Picot border that was drawn after the First World War. Um, 500 kilometers, almost a straight line, totally artificial to divide the Ottoman Empire, actually dividing the Kurds into four different countries, um, Turkey, Iran, uh, Syria and Iraq. So all those local leaders have a stone in the shoe. As some people like to say, they have a problem with minorities that don't have their own state. 
So driving along that border, I was on the Turkish side of Kobane. Kobane is a border town uh, of Syria, and you can watch it like in a stadium, the Battle of uh, Kobane. And now I'll tell you something funny. Kobane doesn't exist. Um, why? The name of that city was and has always been Ain al Arab, which means the source of the Arabs. And now for our Western propaganda, that doesn't sound good because maybe people think, okay, if that's the source of the Arabs, they're probably going to defend it and fight for it. Kobane is an artificial name. And how did that came, come along? Uh, it was only introduced uh, on maps very recently. Um, uh, Kobane uh, actually means company or compagnie. When the Germans were building the Baghdad train uh, through the Ottoman Empire, which was one of the reasons for the First World War, it was right along the stretch uh, that I was traveling there. And in, in uh, this Ain al Arab uh, uh, little town, the local workers uh, were asking the German engineers uh, for, for work. Um, and the, um, the, um, the engineer said, yes, you can work here, but you have to register yourself with our company. That's the military uh, that was protecting them. So go to the company. And the locals understood company, company. And that became the word Kobane. So it's actually a German place, Kobane. Uh, so just to tell a little story how sometimes uh, uh, words make a difference. Uh, and the Battle of Kobane is sort of a, a, a propaganda tool. Uh, actually, there was never um, a real fight against terrorists or ISIS because the Amer Americans were actually behind ISIS, so they're not, they're not going to bomb them. So that's another thing I learned there. Um, I'm holding a bit of a monologue right now. I would have another story about North Korea where I learned uh, something new. Um, uh, Jeff, is, or, or would you like to, to ask me something about <laughs> in between? Uh, I, I'm full of questions, but uh, you can go ahead with your story on North Korea, because I know a bit of this story, and it's also a great one. Yeah, um, in, in North Korea, um, I, I was 15 years ago in the demilitarized zone coming from the south, from uh, South Korea. And um, when you go to that border zone, it's heavy military, it's American troops, UN troops, and they tell you you have to be very quiet, you have to be dress in order, don't wear jeans, don't smile to the other side, uh, don't wave, this be could become aggressive to them and they, anything could happen and uh, sort of uh, be very careful, goose step, stay in the line and so on. Okay, so when I reached the front line, uh, I looked at the other side and there were tourists on the North Korean side and they were probably Chinese or I think Burmese, Myanmar people, they were on the side of North Korea. And they were friendly, they were smiling, they were much more relaxed than us and um, even waving to us. So I thought, oh my God, why are we behaving so strange over here? Okay, now 15 years later, that was this year, January, I am traveling to North Korea. It was the height of the tensions, Trump uh, reneging on his agreement to meet Kim. Uh, it was super cold and no tourists, American tourists were or are still forbidden to travel to North Korea. So talking about travel restrictions, the West does that too. And I realize many things that we learn about North Korea in the West are wrong, are pure propaganda. So I'm not going to defend North Korea. I'm a libertarian. I, I'm certainly the total opposite of defending a communism or a socialist system. But even on the plane, which was very good, uh, Air Corio, uh, there's a business class and there's, um, there's a television screens and friendly services, uh, young air hostesses compared to American Airlines. So um, and there's a, a guy sitting not far from me, a uh, blonde guy. I don't understand the language he talks to his wife. So when we land, I approach him and say, ah, uh, um, you're a tourist. He says, I'm not working here. Oh, so I'm interested. And um, he actually then says um, um, he's, um, he's uh, the national trainer of the North Korean football team. So he's an expat uh, who is working uh, there all the time. And there's more expats working there. And actually, there's um, even business people in North Korea. So it's quite open. Contrary to the narrative, um, there's economic activity, there's even private business people. Uh, my guides, uh, a friendly woman, uh, her, her father was a businessman, uh, through Chinese businessmen trading with uh, foreign countries. And 
And then you, in Pyongyang, it's actually quite a modern uh, city with lots of skyscrapers, really nice houses. And there's no banks inside or insurance companies. Actually, there's real people living in there, scientists, engineers, teachers, obviously also people that are important for their narrative, their propaganda, uh, media people and so on. But um, like in Pyongyang, everything is livable. They only have a problem that uh, the embargo of the West uh, doesn't give them any heating facilities in winter. So it was very, very cold. It's more or less unheated in most buildings. Um, so two important aspects that I learned there. There is a Korean wall. Did you know about that, Jeff, that there is a wall all along the 38 parallel? I, he I heard I, from I you did. that, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I found that unbelievable, but it's even on Wikipedia. It's true. The wall is only visible from the north. It slopes out on the south uh, as like a green hill. And um, this is against, obviously, uh, tanks and uh, troops uh, coming from North Korea to the south. But they build a wall there. And the wall sounds bad to most of us. And yes, it is, because we built it. The West built it, South Korea and America. Uh, so that was uh, strange. And then the strangest thing for me is I realized that researching North Korea, there were several defectors or uh, refugees fleeing over the demilitarized zone, not to the south, as we always believe. No, they fled to the north, a couple of Americans, actually. Why? Because they didn't like the Western narrative and this whole um, lie uh, about the Korean War and so on. And there was even a movie, a British documentary movie about made about those um, refugees, the Western refugees to North Korea. And the film is called Crossing the Line, if I remember correctly. So what a strange um, uh, twist to the narrative that I had learned. Yeah, very interesting. And, and this is why I say it's so important to to visit these places and see things with your own eyes. Of course, not everyone can do that. It takes a fair amount of money to be able to do that and a fair amount of time to be able to do it. But if you do have the opportunity, that's really the only way to know what's actually happening or at least get some sources of people that you kind of trust. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Kulias uh, are, are good sources, in my opinion. I, you know, he's a narco capitalist, so he start, start there and he doesn't work for the mainstream media and things like that. And uh, with Korea, uh, um, I've got my own uh, ideas on what's going on. I think it's all just a big show. This uh, North Korea is uh, dangerous to the United States of all places. Uh, and I think they do that all the time just to keep the military industrial complex going. Um, I think people like Lil Kim, uh, the uh, dictator in North Korea, like, I think he went to school in England or something. I think he's in the, he's, he's, he's with the same people who control all the countries, in my opinion. So I don't think there's any conflict there, but they, of course, have to keep the U.S. constantly in fear, uh, so people keep uh, paying their extortion fees of trillions of dollars per year to the military industrial complex. But one interesting thing that I saw you point out was that you said the biggest issue you saw in North Korea was that they had most things, but they didn't really have good ways of doing heating. Uh, and that's very interesting because according to the mainstream television programming propaganda, they've got a very major nuclear uh, um, um, capabilities. Well, if that's the case, why don't they have a nuclear power generator? Well, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, this was an important observation for me. So like I'm freezing in those hotels. It's like minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, only the room of the foreigner is heated, but the rest is just like an ice cave. So uh, that's because there is no oil, no gas, no coal to be imported into the country. Uh, it's, it's under sanctions, under embargo. So they are suffering, the locals. And then I thought, yeah, uh, they have nuclear technology for uh, their weapons. Uh, naturally, they should master uh, civilian use of um, uh, nuclear energy too. So I asked my guide, who was really very intelligent, uh, why don't you basically uh, have a nuclear power plant here? And she entertained that thought for the first time. She didn't have a good answer. So. Maybe, as you just uh, suggested, too, there is um, just a big game going on and they don't have uh, nuclear capabilities. It's just uh, to scare us. Um, and um, that could be like a, a fake nukes, not fake news, but fake nukes that work for Kim, maybe work for, um, for the West as well, to have a, a, an enemy, a, a, a dictator of the day. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, people suffer uh, from the cold. That, that's a fact, and that makes me sad because usually people in those countries suffer because of us, because of the West. Well, not because of us. We, we're not doing it, but because of the uh, the dictatorships in, in countries where we <laughs> are have, have were born. Uh, but I have nothing to do with them. And yeah, it is sad. Uh, what's your take on the entire Korean War sort of situation back uh, decades ago? Uh, I have to admit, it's one of the U.S. many, many, many wars of terrorist attacks in various countries across the world that I haven't looked into too much. Uh, usually, it's uh, all these wars. Uh, of course, the Vietnam War was a false flag attack with the Gulf of Tonkin. World War One, World War Two, both false flag attacks were involved. 9/11 uh, was a false flag attack to launch the war on terror. Uh, things like that. I haven't heard too much about Korea. And I never even looked into it. But uh, I think you were mentioning that both sides, the North and the South, really want to reunify. But it's really the governments, as a, maybe even more so, the so-called West governments that are keeping that from happen, happening. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Korean War was in a way decided at the conference in Yalta 1945 already between Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill. Um, it was sort of the influence spheres between the Soviet Empire and the West. And that was decided to be the 38th parallel. Uh, and later, um, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, more than uh, five years later, the Korean War was started, in my opinion, mainly to grease the military industrial complex and to create a, a sort of um, hub for um, the Western or the American military uh, at the strategically important uh, point, uh, sort of a wedge between Russia and China. And these strategic ideas cost um, uh, 2.5 million lives of North Koreans. That's a quarter of the population. It's the most bombarded place ever in history. Uh, we're talking about bombs from the sky, uh, no-fly zone type of bombardments. And um, to, to give a, a proportion that is like, I think, a, if in the United States, uh, in a short period of time, 80 million people would be killed by air attacks. That's the proportion. It was the worst bombardment ever in history. And um, it's quite interesting to go to this uh, victorious war museum in Pyongyang and to see the story from the other side. Of course, one could say this is their propaganda, it is, but uh, they just have to tell the truth <laughs> and that's bad enough uh, already. And then you see a lot of captured uh, war material from the Americans and it's a, you see pictures of uh, suffering GIs or dead GIs, mutilated GIs. We don't see this here. Uh, uh, so it's eye-opening uh, to be traveling to the other side occasionally. Yeah, and uh, you know, from what I've heard, that is one of the worst terrorist attacks in human history. Literally, just dropping bombs on an entire country, literally bombing it into rubble. That's the U.S. government uh, spreading freedom and democracy. Uh, exact opposite, of course. Um, and uh, one of the other ones that they always bring up. There's a couple since, since the Soviet Union kind of collapsed because of communism, uh, and um, uh, the U.S. has been very. This is very well documented. All the uh, military industrial complex complex terrorists, people like uh, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, and goes on and on, uh, have been saying for decades, we need a new enemy. And uh, they came up with one a year before 9-11. They said that they needed a new Pearl Harbor, uh, so they did 9-11. But then um, they also uh, have, they, they keep bringing back the same old stories. And it's, it's really sad that anyone believes it. Uh, but one of them is North Korea. About every, once a year, they'll do something and they're like, North Kim, uh, little Kim from North Korea just hacked Paramount Films or something. It's like, oh gosh, oh, oh how terrible. Uh, and But the other one that they really bring out, I think there's one more, but I can't remember off the top of my head, but, or maybe that was, well, anyway, uh, I guess Iraq, but they've been bombing that and uh, occupying that for decades. But the other big one is Iran. And I've seen recently they've been really doing the same old uh, fake stories, the old, same old fake news that Iran has chemical weapons. Where does that sound familiar? Uh, and so I, I'm curious because I haven't been to Iran. I've been meaning to go. I've been trying to go numerous times this year and I just didn't make it. Uh, what's your opinion on Iran? Uh, Iran is a great uh, country to travel to. It's super safe everywhere. There's a good uh, in, in industrialization, like even in remoter places, you see little factories. So they are very uh, smart people. Uh, they get along, although they also have all those sanctions, but at least they have their own energy, one of the biggest oil reserves in the world. I've crossed the country three times uh, in various uh, directions. I can only recommend it. For Americans, there's a bit of a, a procedure to go through, but all other nationalities 
can travel alone um, wherever you want, basically. Uh, so, a uh, beautiful country, uh, definitely on, on the wrong side of history at the moment. One can only pray that they don't have a, uh, another attack against them. Uh, the last big attack was when the, the US was still supporting uh, Saddam Hussein to fight against um, Iran. Uh, so that's it. It's a trademark of, of Western policy since 300 years to to divide and rule and to uh, send peoples fight against each other that are actually neighbors and brothers uh, like uh, the Germans and the Russians are sent against each other um, every now and then and here the Iraqis and the Iranis. Uh, yeah, so I, I recommend uh, that country. Um, I can even recommend northern Iraq. It's very safe, uh, Kurdistan has always been safe, even at the height of so-called ISIS uh, attacks, there was not any danger in northern Iraq if you stayed in Erbil or in Suleimania. Uh, Baghdad is a bit more tricky, I was just there, that's true. Uh, you can even say that all those axes of evil countries are good to travel to. North Sudan, great, I loved it. Pyramids, um, desert, uh, Khartoum is beautiful. And uh, most important, Russia. <laughs> Siberia is my, uh, my favorite uh, place to travel all over the world. It could even be the freest and um, most libertarian or anarcho capitalist place to travel to. I love Siberia. But we are told Putin is bad and uh, don't go there, it's dangerous and so on. It's, it's, this is just propaganda and creation of an enemy. Yeah, absolutely. Let um, me ask you about the uh, yeah. Kurds. I've heard uh, from a number of people, including I think even Doug Casey at one point, mentioning that they're quite anarchist, really, and they're quite autonomous in that area. Uh, what, what's your view on the Kurds? I don't know anything about it. I've never been there. I, I don't know much about it. So I'm curious on your take. The Kurds that live in northern Iraq uh, uh, play their cards best. They were already quite autonomous under uh, Saddam times. That's why there were also attacks against them from Saddam. And um, they are very wealthy because there's a lot of oil wells there. And they were a main profiteer of the initial ISIS attacks because basically the game was that ISIS attacked uh, Kirkuk, the oil wells of uh, main Iraq, uh, of southern Iraq, so to speak. And then northern Iraq fights back and whoops, wins the oil wells of Kirkuk. So suddenly they become richer. Uh, so that has been pushed back a little now, but um, they, they have a lot of money there, um, not only because the Germans are paying and sending weapons and many other countries, um, but uh, they have oil. And uh, Airbill, uh, I think there's at least 30 airlines flying there practically every day. And um, you have huge um, highways with bonsai trees in the middle of the lane and green grass. And you have super modern Dubai style apartments and hotels. Uh, so that's 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 the Kurdish um, home area one could travel to easiest these days. Northern Syria with Syrian Kurds is a bit difficult now. Um, Turkey has their conflict with the Kurds for a long time. And the Iranian Kurdish area, it's, it's not a problem. You can travel there. I was there. Um, there's actually a, a beautiful drive of the mountains. And then uh, on the other side, um, into Iraq, you travel uh, the Hamilton Road, which was built by the British, I think, in the First World War. And um, the Brits and the Americans always used uh, Iraq and Iran uh, also against the Germans to, to resupply Russia uh, from the south. A lot of history there. The Kurds are a key player, but they don't have their own country. Very interesting. So I guess uh, kind of my point of uh, one of my main reasons I wanted to have you on is so many people in places like the US or Canada or Europe have this impression that the world is a dangerous place. And uh, but many of them have never traveled anywhere. In fact, many people think Mexico, where I am right now, is really dangerous. And I feel safer here than almost anywhere else in the world, truly. And um, so I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that, about what you would tell people about that, because a lot of people, uh, when they hear about uh, numerous of these places, like you just mentioned so many, that they would no one would ever go, Iraq, Syria, uh, uh, North Korea, uh, because they're so scared because of the media. Um, you know, really, the, the, the major problems I've had, Somalia was bad, Mogadishu was really bad, but I, uh, some people, there was some bombs went off near us, so yes, I was definitely in some danger there. But other than that, 
that, I, I mostly have mostly dangerous situations in places like the U.S. where I get extorted and kidnapped all the time. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's this idea for a lot of Americans, especially, that uh, the U.S. is the best country on earth, it's the freest country on earth, and that it's, uh, you know, why would you leave the U.S.? The whole world's dangerous. I see the U.S. as being one of the more dangerous places to visit, depending on where you go. Of course, it's a giant place. Uh, but if you go to, like, south side of Chicago, you're going to have a bad time. There's like 50 people shot every weekend there because it's a uh, no gun zone. So uh, uh, what's your opinion on, on that in general? What would you tell your average person about the danger of traveling and going to all these countries? Yeah, we totally click on this uh, subject, Jeff. Um, obviously, uh, for me, the United States is one of the most dangerous places because you have um, the state uh, really exaggerating his powers more than in any other country. Like a police control in the U.S. is always something where you hope that nothing goes wrong. Uh, I was going in a, uh, that's at least five years ago, I bought a car in New York and on an export number plate drove it all down the Panamericana Highway. And just uh, before uh, Laredo, the border to uh, northern Mexico, uh, my buddy was driving, was going way too fast and the police car came from uh, the opposite side and we didn't know they can measure the speed from the opposite side so they stopped us and then my buddy had to do the whole procedure uh, get out get on your knees uh, arms on your back and so on and then we had to show all our cash luckily they didn't take it uh, and also they could see we're sort of good people uh, well dressed austrian talking like schwarzenegger my buddy and uh, so we we didn't have a problem but that could become a problem and i know uh, it happens um, in the U.S., uh, the the state is is the most monstrous um, phenomenon more than in any other place in the world. Uh, I don't um, really uh, look so much into like gang violence or normal violence that can happen anywhere if you're in the wrong part of town. But obviously, uh, uh, the states is one of the most uh, not inhomogeneous uh, countries in the world, and that usually creates um, criminality. One of the reasons we get this migration wave now in Europe that creates tensions. And uh, at the end of the day, the biggest danger for a traveler anywhere in the world is traffic accidents. And um, that you you can't really protect uh, if there's an idiot hitting you uh, with an oncoming oncoming truck. That's going to be it. If you're in, in Bosasso, Puntland, where I was re recently, or in, in Boston, USA, that's the biggest risk in my opinion. Yeah, so very interesting that that's the biggest risk is, is uh, things that people do every day and don't even think about it is uh, automobile uh, accidents and, and things like that. Yes. Uh, Jeff, may I just add, I have obviously developed some techniques how to travel safer, not to become a victim. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with your composure, um, how you interact with people. Mm -hmm. uh, looking like a tourist in sandals and shorts, uh, that makes people a victim. And traveling by train or bus where you end up in undesirable parts of town, that is more dangerous than uh, riding a taxi, for example. So um, try to be strong uh, and uh, then uh, people will um, not go after you. And that's not only the small petty criminal, even uh, the other uh, dangerous guys like uh, the, the police men in some countries or the, um, uh, the border control uh, tax um, uh, duty, uh, custom duty people, uh, they obviously <laughs> like to make you a dancing bear if you look like easy prey. I certainly don't look like that and usually I don't have trouble. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I do as well. Uh, wherever I am, I try to generally fit in with the local uh, culture to an extent. Um, obviously, I'm not wearing like, I haven't been to Saudi Arabia, but I probably wouldn't wear the whole white uh, bathrobe thing or whatever they wear. Uh, but, you know, I try to at least uh, appear like I, I belong there to some extent, whether it's like as a businessman or, uh, as you pointed out, don't be walking around with your map and your your fo your camera around your neck <laughs> anywhere including the US don't don't do that anywhere and then looking like you're all confused and lost uh, you know people pick up on that and and as well as you pointed out this is something that goes even without travel. This just goes in day-to-day -day life. If you walk around and you look scared and you look weak, uh, you will attract people who want to take advantage of you. Uh, so, as a as a guy, walk with your stand straight up. You know, walk, don't don't be all like. I actually remember once I saw a person on the street and they were walking down the street and they looked so fearful. And it was a bad part of town. I forget where I was, somewhere in the U.S. And I saw this guy walking along and he was basically like walking like this. And I was like, man, that guy's gonna get 
mugged. And I'm in a bad part of town too, but I'm just walking along. And I'm like, I see someone I'm like, hey, how you doing? You know, like, you know, just kind of like, you know, act like you belong there a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that, that's good advice. And, and he pointed out as well, that's one of the risks as well as all the governments. Um, and that's, you've probably had this happen so many times. I have just issues with customs and, and government people and where have you, where are you going? Why, why, where are you going next? Where did you come from? And that to me is always the biggest uh, problem is just governments. And, and, and it's like in the U.S., it's like one of the worst. Actually, where I'm originally from, Canada, it's one of the worst in the world. Um, I've, I, I've heard so many. I've gone to the back room in the Vancouver airport so many times, and they basically get me stripped naked. They, they threaten me with all kinds of stuff and ask me for hours, all kinds of stupid questions. And uh, they do that with other people, too. It's not just me. I've heard, like, I, I, have, I know one woman. She's, like, in her 60s, a Chinese woman, the nicest person I've ever known in my life. She got pulled into the back once for hours. Um, so, yeah, basically, when it comes down to, as anarchists, what's the biggest risk, risk traveling? It's usually just the governments in all these places. Yeah, absolutely. I got grilled in the U.S. once in the back room, but it was okay because I could really uh, explain why I have all those weird passport stamps. Uh, but uh, after this interview now, maybe my risk is a lot higher. So. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Uh, I seem, I used to always have troubles going to the U.S. And lately, I don't know, I, I've got like a green flag on their computer system. Like they just, as soon as they swipe it or, or beep it or whatever they do now, they just go, oh, go right ahead. So either, okay. I think I got pulled over, like I got, I used to go to the US and literally every time they'd look at the screen, they'd look at me and they'd go back room. And uh, it'd be like hours back there, they'd be like threatening to like uh, kill me. Uh, I, I wish I had like a pen camera to show people, people don't believe me, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then after years and years of that, and I was like, this is back a couple of years ago when I said, I'm never going back to the US. Uh, I decided after a few years, I'm like, I'll go back, I'll put it up with it every now and then. And ever since then, I've gotten this green light. It's like something, maybe someone on the inside is like a, a fan or something, and he just put like a green check mark or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, the US is really bad. Canada is really bad. Australia is so bad. Uh, it's mostly the Western countries, actually. Uh, although I, I will say that I had a pretty bad experience in an airport once, and that was in Turkey. Uh, and I was curious about your uh, story about growing up there. That's a really strange place. And it's interesting you said that's where the deep state uh, um, uh, phrase first started. There, there seems to be some very, uh, it's very statist. It's, it's very controlling. The airport there, I had a, I got Got pulled in uh, there. I also got pulled in in um, Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, they they stripped me down. Uh, they threatened to beat me up. They stole my laptop and said they were going to send it back to me. One year later, they sent it back uh, to my dad's house, and I don't even know how they found his house. And it was all parts. It was like literally all screws and bolts, and they took it all apart. Uh, so those are a few of my horror stories. But you know, again, like I, I always get through it fine. Like that's really the the risk is mostly government. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I want to comment on uh, what you said about Turkey. Um, Turkey has changed a lot since President Erdogan uh, took over and reshaped the country. Uh, first of all, he built amazing infrastructure that's important for people who live there. So there's a third Bosphorus bridge, uh, there's two other big bridges uh, over the Strait of um, Gallipoli, actually. Just now, uh, the biggest airport in the world has just been opened in Istanbul. And uh, he's uh, building a parallel Bosphorus, an artificial Bosphorus. I mean, these are huge projects. That's really visionary. That's why people uh, love him, but it's sort of the normal people. The elite doesn't like him because the elite in the past was more connected to the West. And um, the deep state in Turkey was actually a, a control of the system uh, invisibly uh, through structures in the military, in the secret services, uh, in universities, uh, the teaching community and so on. And um, this uh, whole um, mix uh, came up in a famous incident called the Susurluk accident, which is a little city in uh, western uh, central Anatolia, uh, where there was after midnight a um, big Mercedes uh, 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 driving into a lorry and uh, the, the people in the Mercedes were all killed in the accident. And it turns out one was Abdullah Chatle, that was a famous hitman, um, provided with passports by the German, uh, sorry, by the Turkish um, uh, Secret Service, and um, uh, known to, to, to work of hit lists uh, for um, 
their deep state. And next to him seated was a Kurdish militia leader and there was a, a supermodel and a drug baron. And so through that incident and a lot of weapons and stuff in the car, uh, suddenly it was clear that there were um, sort of unhealthy connections in the country. And Erdogan claimed all that, especially after the putsch, which um, he used to his advantage, uh, without a doubt, Gulen, his adversary, backed by the CIA, wanted to push him out of office. And Erdogan knew about it. Uh, he got a hint from Putin, and then he could sort of um, take and um, uh, create his own putsch scenario a little earlier than Gulen's uh, scheduled putsch, and therefore had a, a, a tactical advantage. And uh, since then, he is basically in control, and he's kicking out all those deep state structures, which is people not working for Turkey, but working for the interest of Western countries. And the term deep state is now used uh, in many other countries. I know in the US, Trump apparently is working against the deep state. I have my doubts. Um, in, in Germany, we have the phenomenon. Uh, basically, that's a Western phenomenon. And we've learned about it from Turkey. Oh, very interesting. And I should point out all my problems with government, uh, when I, you know, customs and all that sort of stuff. It used to be a lot worse in the past because I used to not be nice to them at all. Uh, I used to really be very not nice to them. So I'd walk up and they'd go, hello, sir. I'd be like, whatever. And they'd be like, well, uh, where are you coming from today? I'm like, where are you coming from? And they'd be like pretty quickly in the back. And so over, I'm getting older now. And so I actually, I, I try to act nice with them just so I can get through. Uh, actually, Doug Casey's got one story I totally love uh, that he said he was going through. And he's the kind of person who has a really hard time being nice to them as well. And I think he still to this day isn't very nice to them. And uh, he walked up somewhere and uh, they stamped his passport and they gave it back to him. And the guy who gave it back to him said, thank you. And and Doug just like took his passport and started walking. And the guy got kind of angry and he said, uh, hey, hey. And Doug turned around and he said, I said, thank you. And Doug goes, I heard you the first time. <laughs> That's Doug. That, that is one of my superheroes out there. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Colia's actually ran out of uh, space on his uh, smartphone hard, hard drive or whatever they call it, and also on his SD card. So we're now on Zoom with not a very good internet connection. And but I was planning on wrapping it up anyway because we've been going on for quite a while. And and uh, but very interesting stories, Colia. And um, and thank you for coming on. I look forward to seeing you at the Dollar Ridge Line. Summit uh, coming up February 12th, 13th, and Arcapoco February 14th, 17th. Uh, love to have people like yourselves who's uh, really seen the world. Uh, I know you're very involved in Liberland. Uh, is there anything that we didn't talk about or anything you want to mention? Maybe you have a blog or maybe you're Extreme Traveler or Congress you want to let people know about or anything like that? Um, actually, um, I, I don't want to um, advertise those things. I'm doing this voluntarily, um, uh, pro bono, not for. Um, uh, good community and travelers. Um, I'm a citizen of Liberland and a diplomat from Liberland. I'm very proud that Vidyat Ditschka is my president, uh, also one of my idols out there. And um, I, I have uh, some more stories about war zones. Uh, I was in Donetsk recently and in many other places. So maybe there's the opportunity uh, we can talk about that um, whenever you, you like, Jeff. Yeah, that sounds good. If we don't do it here on Anarchast, we'll do it on the beach here when you come to Acapulco. It's actually raining today. It's been raining the last two days, which is very rare for Acapulco. It usually rains maybe five days a year. Uh, and we're just at the end of the rainy season now where it rains five days a year. Uh, but it'll be nice and sunny out there uh, by February. So I look forward to seeing you uh, out here at Acapulco. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, Colia. It's been a pleasure. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share down below, share with all your status friends who are all scared of the world and share with the people who are all scared North Korea is going to bomb them or Iran's going to attack. Uh, it's all propaganda and the U.S. government is by far the biggest terrorist organization on earth and they got to stop paying their taxes and, and get out of that as soon as possible. Uh, it, it's the only way to kind of save the world is to end the U.S. government in my opinion and all other governments at the same time. Uh, of course, this is Anarchast. So that's it for Anarchast. You're home for Anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. <laughs>
Ready, ready, ready. 